Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2016 Banff World Media Festival. Uh, it is a pleasure to have you all out in the Rockies this year, and we are thrilled to have everybody. Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is John Nixon. I'm the lead producer for the, for the Banff program. Um, so we're looking forward to an amazing week of sessions, keynotes, master classes, lots of networking. Uh, we'll just make this an amazing experience for everyone here. So to kick off the week, uh, we've got a great session ahead. Uh, but first, I would like to introduce Valerie Creighton, the President and CEO of Canada Media Fund. Valerie. I'm falling on my high heels and I haven't even started drinking yet. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Valerie Creighton. I have the pleasure of serving as CEO at the CMF. And before I say just a couple of words to you, we're going to take a look at the shape Canada's in and the digital future. Can you please roll the video? Okay, you like that? Is it worthwhile? Okay. It's a new one, so I just want to test it out on you. I think it's the first time we've ever shown it. So, Well, it's always a great pleasure to return to Banff. The CMF's been a major partner and supporter for many years, and I'm always thrilled to see all of you here. So with all these thought-provoking sessions, unparalleled opportunities for networking, partners from across the globe, and of course this incredible place where we find ourselves in the Rockies, it's easy to see why Banff's such a great success year after year. So on that note, can we give Robert and Fern, neither of whom are here, so to hell with them, eh? Robert and Fern and all of the team at Achilles a great round of applause for doing all the hard work they do. The CMF has a central role supporting the creative and industrial growth of the Canadian television and digital media industry, and we hope responding to the industry's changing needs. Well, a lot's happened in our industry in the past few years. In the 10 years I've been at the organization, CMF triggered a 60% increase in production volume, reaching an all-time high of 1.4 billion in 1516. Over that same time, program budgets increased 40%. Public investment is being leveraged to a greater extent than it was 10 years ago. So with the job creation, economic impact, enhancing Canada's reputation worldwide, and sales and export as a result of all the work you do, this is evidence that our ecosystem has worked. Since the last time we met here in Banff, the CRTC released four regulatory broadcasting policies in connection with Let's Talk TV proceeding. These decisions touched on a variety of issues like simultaneous substitution, discoverability, and the move towards the unbundling of cable and satellite television subscription packages, all of which have a major impact on our industry. Shaw and Chorus struck a transformative deal which increased the scale and leverage of Chorus. Viceland demonstrated how consolidation and diversification are not necessarily unidirectional. And virtual reality and augmented reality technology are now poised to enjoy wide release in the consumer market, with the technology giants aggressively entering the arena, releasing devices at prices consumers can now afford. And the telecommunications industry is faced with growing challenges, spurred by increased consumption of mobile video and the soaring demand for wireless data. 
So our industry is being tested on multiple fronts as we try to maximize these great opportunities that the digital world has to offer. However, in my view at least, now more than ever before, it's clear that investing in Canadian content is not just good cultural policy. It's good economic and good foreign policy. Our stories reach the world and build Canada's brand value while bringing in millions of dollars in sales and revenue leveraged from outside the country. This content feeds the pipelines of Canada's digital economy. There are many diverse perspectives in our industry. There are many success stories emerging from user-driven content, and it'll take innovative and collective thinking to position Canada's audiovisual industry to meet these opportunities for the future. I, for one, look forward to the consultations on Canadian content in a digital world that our Minister Jolly has announced and commend her for this initiative, and we can all and should all contribute to this crucial dialogue. Let's give her a warm welcome when she arrives later today. So all of you, enjoy, be productive, meet new people, take a risk, and for God's sake, do a deal. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Val. Uh, we could not do this event without the support of yourself and the CMF, so thank you so much. Um, and now it's my pleasure to welcome up another one of our, our partners, uh, the sponsor of this session. Uh, we have Matt Matheson, the Director of Marketing Communications for the Banff Center. Welcome up, Matt. Hi, everyone. First session, eh? Uh, so I'm Matt Matheson, the Director of Marketing Communications at the Banff Center. Um, and we have been a longtime partner and supporter of the Banff World Media Festival, so delighted to be here again today. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the BAM Center, we are a training and learning organization. That's, and that's what the video is going to sound like in two seconds. Um, uh, we're situated just actually right over there on Tunnel Mountain, and we've been there since 1933. And it, uh, what we focus on is helping artists and leaders work in creative spaces and advance their artistic practice. So this is everything from opera to dance to journalism to visual, digital, and media arts. Um, and we'll play the video to give you a little bit more of a taste here. for the first session, Don't Blow It at Your Next Pitch. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jeannie and Mark Simon, pitch experts and CEOs of Sell Your TV Concept Now. Hi, everybody. As you probably guessed, I'm Jeannie Simon, and thank you for coming to, to the first session of Banff. It's called Don't Blow It at Your Next Pitch Meeting. Oh, hang on mic. just a second. Do I have a mic? Hey, Jeannie, your first pitch meeting is here. Okay, let him in. Whoa, this is great. Hey, how you doing? You know, I've got the greatest...
this show, it's gonna change your network. Get rid of all that crap that you're playing right now. Okay. You are gonna make so that... much money. Stop. What? You're out. <laughs> you blew it. <laughs> what we don't want is for you guys to go down in flames. And believe it or not, that and a lot of other things, we actually hear all the time. Any executives in here who take pitch meetings? You hear enough of that shit, so you're not gonna need to get into it. <laughs> <laughs> Who here is pitching for the first time at a major conference? Oh, good. There's a few of you. The rest of you are either lying or you <laughs> crashed and burned the first time, and hopefully we're going to help you get through it a little bit better. OK, so I am, along with Mark, we are co-CEOs and co-founders of Sell Your TV Concept Now. And I have worked, actually produced content for all of these networks. So. Um, Probably some of the, the, my most favorite shows that I did were for Nickelodeon. Some of their top, um, the, some of their top shows like Clarissa Explains It All with Melissa Joan Hart, Allegra's Window, Gullah Gullah Island, Wienerville, or as we called it, Dick City. City. <laughs> so <clears throat> I also noticed I'm holding the big Turner logo. So I co-created an entire network for Turner. And what I mean by that is every single show, we did the budgeting, we did the staffing. I did the first live action show for Cartoon Network with Carrot Top. And we forgive you for that. Yeah, it, <laughs> it was forgettable. Um, we are also partnered and associated with all the major conferences. Obviously, BAMP is our favorite. It is awesome here. <laughs> but we also are affiliated, affiliated with Real Screen, Mythcom, Nappy. That's me on stage at NAB show, year before last. We did a session on pitching there as well. And then these are some of the shows that either um, we've created and sold, like that one um, of the funky, moronic looking oh, Timmy. Boy Timmy Scout, that's nature. Timmy. That was on Nick. Right, yeah. and then in the other corner, in, in upper right hand corner, that's a show, um, that's our client Shaboom, and he had created and starred in a show called Shaboom for kids. Yeah, he's actually got two series on right now. Yeah. Oh, and your latest. Well, yeah, this is the latest thing. I just wrapped this project. So this is a one-hour documentary feature called Elephants in Motion. It is a good news story about elephants in Thailand and how the Thai government and the royal family is doing everything they can to conserve elephants. So that's what the one-hour documentary is about. It is being distributed by Espresso TV out of London. And so far, on this poster, there's just two awards. I think we've won, I've kind of lost count, but at least 15. All right, so as far as what I'm bringing to this party, obviously we've created and developed a lot of shows together. Uh, I've been working in the industry for about 30 years. I've written 10 industry books, including the Bible of storyboarding, which is m one of my favorite things in the industry to do, uh, in, uh, which led me into directing. Uh, I also work with Toon Boom, which is obviously a great Canadian company. I help them with the development of their Storyboard Pro software, which we won an Emmy for, uh, I guess, three years ago now. And I'm also the uh, lead trainer worldwide for that software for them. Um, and I've worked on over 4,000 different productions, on everything from different TV shows, over 40 feature films, um, from, you know, obviously Magic City. Sequest goes all the way back. That's actually when I got my start on doing second unit direction for Spielberg on that, which started from my story, uh, storyboarding. Um, and in fact, that's, I'm um, there on set, there directing. And then Timmy, we're also the first grand prize winners in the Nickelodeon um, uh, Film Fest. So we're really excited for the Nick party on, um, oh, yeah. was that Monday night? Because uh, yeah. we were there at the very beginning when Nick, uh, when Nick actually went national. She was one of the top producers. I was the second designer at the network. So we've got some very special Nickelodeon things that we're going to be wearing. Um, uh, I've won somewhere over 200 international awards for projects I've written and developed uh, and directed. So uh, from that came now selling somewhere in the order of around 40 different projects, which means I do a shitload of pitching. Uh, and, uh, and because of that, we've literally screwed up everything you can possibly screw up. <laughs> and so we're going to try to keep you and help you from making the same dumbass mistakes that we made. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that you all, especially those of you who raised your hand, so you're here pitching for the first time, we want to make sure that you have proper expectations of what happens here. So when you pitch and an executive hopefully says, 
what else can you give me? Meaning they want, to have you, they want your treatment, maybe your sizzle reel, your one sheet, maybe a script as well if you have that for your show. And they want to take that back to their team. That is actually a home run. That's fantastic and to be celebrated. Because any one person that you are pitching here can't green light your show. It just doesn't happen like that. It's not up to one person. Yeah, the first show we sold, it took somewhere on the order of four months to finish closing it. But without having pitched it at a conference, there was no way we would have gotten to that point. So you want to make it so that they, they're, the person you're pitching to, if they're interested in bringing it back, that's the expectation that you want. And then you'll close it right, later. Right. So don't be upset if after a pitch they don't whip out a contract. Put that on the table. Not Plus you happen. only have 10 minutes in the face-to-face. -face. A little hard to sign a contract that amount <laughs> right. of time. So basically, you know, we just don't want you guys to blow it. And there's a lot of different ways you can blow it. And there's a lot of ways you can do it right. And to take you through the right ways to do it, it's always best to really go through what is the proper flow of a pitch meeting so that you don't jump in like I did when I first came up here and jumping into all the wrong things, including before she was even ready to hear from me. Because you've got to remember, the, the, all these execs, they're hearing things over and over and over before you get there. Right. So, I mean, this seems obvious, right? Introduction. But it's really important, even in those 10-minute face-to-face um, meetings you guys have. So I think in those meetings here, you can only take one person, right? I think so. So, but there will be occasion, because a lot of you here, are, I'm sure, are here with partners. Maybe one other person, two other people. So if you're in that situation, make sure that everybody on your team is introduced. And other times, you'll be meeting an, an executive team, maybe of two or three people. So just make sure everybody shakes hands and knows each other. Yeah. And then building a bridge. Really important because no matter what, when you pitch, the people you're pitching are people. They have lives. You're interrupting a flow. So they may have been on the phone. Here, they will have definitely heard another pitch. So if you build this bridge, the introduction is part of that. Um, something else that can be part of that is if you do a little bit of research, you might find out a show that maybe that person worked on. And you can say, gee, I really love that show. You know, don't lie about it, but be authentic about it because they may ask you. Can lie. you. It's okay. No well, one minds. They could say, so what's your favorite episode? You know, you don't want to get caught. Um, but a little flattery uh, definitely helps grease the wheel. And it could even be something as simple as, uh, man, it's really cold in here, and you've got to sit in here for an entire hour. That little bit of yeah. something, because you know what it's like when someone walks right up in front of you? Your mind is off somewhere else, and it takes a little bit to all of a sudden, okay, now I'm focused on you. And that's what small talk does. Right. That little bit, and if, if you make them feel great about themselves, great, but even if it's just bullshit nonsense, give them that moment so they're actually focusing on you. Otherwise, they might miss the first minute and a half of your pitch. So once you get to that point where all of a sudden that connection is there, or they might even ask you, all right, so tell me what you've got, or what's your show about? Well, what you don't want to do is jump right into, well, you're going to make a lot of money, or, you know, I spent $50,000 putting this together. Mm -hmm. No one gives a shit how much money you put into your show. A good show is a good show. If you spent two cents or $100,000, it's irrelevant. Don't bring it up. That's not part of your pitch. Don't get into, my kids love my show. My aunt once, uh, uh, well, the, my aunt that died three weeks ago, she loved the show. No one cares about that. And please do not say this is going to be the next Mad Men, the next uh, SpongeBob SquarePants, the next Game of Thrones. First of all, any HBO people here love Game of Thrones. <laughs> but don't compare it to freaks of nature of hit successes that you're likely not going to, to match. It's just all hype anyway. Yeah, at that they're point. going to roll their eyes. Yeah. Don't, get, don't compare yourself to the best on TV. Mm -hmm. Prove it with the best pitch. Right, so one of the things that I do when I pitch this show, this is a show that Mark and I created called Luke and Reese Save the World. It's an animation. So what I do when I open this pitch is I say, um, my husband and I created this show called Luke and Resave the World, and it's based on stories that I used to tell my kids at bedtime because I had been reading books to them, but they got bored of that, I guess. So they would say, Mom, tell me a story with your mouth, and that meant make it up. 
So that's what I did, and I did that like for months, like probably six months, I think. I was exhausted. I was making up stories every night. But I collected them, and that was the foundation for this show. So you can see when I pitched that show, I injected myself into it, how I came up with it, the basis for it. I've already set up the characters in it. Yeah. They, in fact, one of the questions your law firm is going to get, well, how did you come up with the show? So if you've got a great connection to it, start with that. Mm -hmm. You know, the more you're connected to it, write what you know. You've all heard that, write what you know. And that's what Jeannie was doing. She was writing what she knew because this is part of, uh, part of raising our kids. So as we look at, at putting a pitch together and being in a pitch meeting, we look at an inverted pyramid. Start broad and then narrow down. And, and there's a couple different parts of the pitch that we look at this. The first part is you want to put in their mind what it is that you're pitching so that they start, as you give them details, they can put it into the right category. So I've got a half hour animated series for kids called Luke and Reese Save the World. Okay? If I start pitching something, they might think it's a live action drama. But by the time I get to the point of telling them it's an animated kids show, their mind is off way the wrong direction. And now they've got to come back and try to figure out what the hell is this and try to remember everything I had said leading up to it. Don't put yourself or your pitch in that position. Start with telling them what kind of show it is and who it's for. Just start right there. The other way of doing a uh, thing of looking at the big picture is starting with the show overview of what is my show and then we'll narrow it down into some other information. So for instance, we, uh, I might talk about with Luke and Reese Save the World mm -hmm. is all about these identical twin boys who want to protect their mama from only dangers they can see, but they are real dangers because she's a scientist and people are trying to steal her ideas. That's the broad overview. So that leads us into... Right, so the character. So you can see we started with a broad overview. Now we're going to narrow down to more detail. So here's a great tip. With characters, Use, make sure you use their names. Don't oh, refer yeah. to them as the bad guy or the geeky girl or the scientist. Give them a name because that's the way we relate to people in story and in real life. They become more real then. Exactly. So once you set up the characters, and if you have, and some of you with scripted shows probably have a whole lot of characters, try just to focus on, in your short pitch on the main characters. Otherwise, you're going to overwhelm people. So I just set up Luke and Reese very simply. It's about Luke and Reese, identical twins, and they are opposites. One is a neat freak, and he will never, ever break a rule. So if his mother says, don't move a muscle, you know, he's not going to move a muscle. Whereas the other one never listens. He'll wear dirty, stained, ripped clothing and totally teases his brother for not breaking the rules. Whenever you can associate one of your characters with someone you know or a character that you've seen, that's better than just saying it's the nerdy girl and the really smart boy or the kid in the wheelchair. Well, those aren't characters, okay? The, that basically says you haven't developed your characters at all. So if you can, for us, talk about Luke and Reese, it's easy. It's our kids. We just describe all the idiosyncrasies that we laugh at about them. So we'll often, whenever we're developing things, we'll think about, well, you know, that's kind of like Bill. How would I describe Bill? And I'll just literally talk about someone I know, which gives more depth to the character. So try not to just do the top level nonsense that doesn't really tell you shit about the characters. Okay, so once you set up the characters, now you can get into a deeper level of detail. And you can tell, like, pull out one of your favorite episodes out of your show and tell it briefly entertainingly and using the characters' names. So this way, what's going to happen is, of course, TV people are very visual, and they will start visualizing what they're going to see on television. Very important. In fact, uh, who here has a comedy? There's, one, yeah. uh, there's a couple. Damn well better be funny when you pitch your show. Yeah. The biggest thing that we see when people are pitching comedies, it sounds like a drama. A dramatic pitch is not a comedy. You will never sell a comedy if you're not funny, okay? Funny people make funny shows. And if your story idea is not funny, work on it or come up with a different example. Mm -hmm. So it's just something that we run into all the time. The other thing is, uh, we're talking about uh, when pitching episodes and pitching the show, a lot of times an executive will think that it's younger than what you think it's for. I think this is for teenagers. Really, it looks like preschool to me. 
might sound funny, but we see this all the, all time. the time. Just go, you know, we were thinking that too, and just go with it. Don't argue with them because if they're the buyer, if they see it for an age group, good, they see it as a place they might <laughs> buy it for. Don't argue things like that. It's a stupid thing to argue against. You know what, something else, before we go on to that. Okay. So w when I was describing the characters, I said, Reese is a rule breaker. And then we gave that example that he won't move a muscle. <laughs> See, that was great because now the executive understands what kind of rules we're talking about and the kind of humor that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So do it, always provide, like if you say somebody is crabby or, you know, whatever, provide just a, a little example that you can tell succinctly. You can't, you know, you don't have hours and hours of time for a it. A good example of that, uh, we were working with someone who had uh, a reality show about a really hot young man, a hot young woman, who were, uh, were fixer-uppers, you know, people in their first home. And there was a lot of sexual oh, yeah. innuendo. And they kept going on. I said, wait, 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 stop. What do you mean sexual innuendo? Because what you think sexual innuendo is might be totally different than the crazy shit going into my head, okay? So don't just say that without following up. So if you say someone's crazy, or if, for this in example, all right, there's a lot of sexual innuendo. For instance, they might be building uh, uh, the, the bottom of a, the footboard to a bed, and he'll, and he'll say, and so really, because you don't want to take up too much room, we'll make this nine inches wide. And she might like it and go, so that's nine inches? But that gives you an idea. All right, so it's soft. It's yeah, not it's really that mild. titillating, but it might make you chuckle a little bit. You know, give them an example so they're not wondering, well, where is it? And can you really be funny? And what do you really mean by this? Right. So once you get through giving them an idea of what the show is, an example episode, how, how many people have animations? Anyone? Okay, there's a few of you. We actually do this for live actions as well. But we no longer produce sample animation when we're pitching animation because it's incredibly expensive and time consuming. But there's other issues too. So we use animatics. You know, video storyboards. Anyone in production has seen these before. But it's becoming much, much faster and easier to make animatics in production. The benefits of doing it this way is with an animatic, if an executive sees something, it's like, I, you know, I like what this is, but you know, maybe, I, maybe I'd like the character design to be a little bit different. When it's in rough form like this, we're all used to this being in pre-production, and things can change. If it's finished animation, Oftentimes, an executive will look at it and go, oh, it's already too finished. I can't inject any ideas. No, there are no changes I can make. And it starts, they start building their own wall against saying yes to your idea. But this, you can make any change. You want the kid's head a little bit bigger? You want three eyes on his head instead of two? Great, yeah, we can do that because we've not produced a finished animation yet. So there's only benefits in pitching with an animatic. And like I said, we do this with live action, especially like with game shows, because mm -hmm. game shows are incredibly expensive because it's all about the shiny floor set. And uh, you know, if you want to spend 150 grand designing a set, go for it. I'd rather just show them some drawings and let the network actually pay for all of that. So now you've told them basically everything about your show. Maybe you've showed them an animatic, showed them a demo reel. So now it's time for you to answer some questions hopefully, from the executives, because questions are good. It means they want from more information, they're interested. They may give you some notes and interject comments. Okay, so let's go over some of the questions you might get asked. All right. Who gave you my name? <laughs> they're fired. Hopefully you're not gonna hear that. How did you come up with this idea? It's kind of the way we talked about how to start right. it. What's the budget? So that's kind of a trick question, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're not expecting you to pull, to pull out a line-by-line -line budget. You can't do a line-by-line. -line no, you really because can't. Because every network is different. Right. There, uh, there's no way for you to know that. Right. But they just want to know, like for animation, just because I, I deal with that a lot. If you say, well, 35000 an episode, they're instantly going to know you have no freaking idea what you're talking about. So that's just a trick question to see if you have any clue of what the normal rates would be. Where will your show fit in our channel? So hopefully you guys have done some homework and you have some idea of where your show might go. And if you can like really pinpoint it and say, you know, I think my show would fit after Deadliest Catch, great, let them know that. Who else has seen it? Ooh, this is a good question because this means they're interested. They want to know who their possible competition is. Right. Do you have an agent? 
this definitely means that they're interested because they're trying to think about who they might mean, need to negotiate with or if it's just going to be easy dealing with just with you. Do you have tape? Do you have video? Do you have sizzle? That means they want to see more. They want to see if you're, if you're able to translate your pitch into something that's going to be interesting to watch on TV. What's the average airspeed of an unladen swallow? This means that they're a geek. If you're a geek too, have fun with them. And it's okay, you know what, it's okay to joke around in a pitch. It doesn't have to be serious. Have fun, because the more fun you have, the more fun you're going to be in production. You know, look, we do this because we love it, right? I mean, production is fantastic. I love every aspect of doing it. Why not have fun in your pitch, too? The best pitch is a conversation. So talk to the person, because they're people. Executives are just people. They just have to be people with all the shit that we want. <laughs> what can I take with me? Again, they're very interested, which means hand them your, your uh, one sheet if you've got it, your treatment if you've got it. If it's a scripted show, get them a script. If you want to make them really happy, say, you know, I've, I've got a script here, but I'm sure you've got a lot to carry back with you. Would you like me to send you a PDF? Would that be easier for you? 100% of the time, they'll say yes. But, and this is also a trick for you guys, because that gives you the opportunity to either make some adjustments from what you found out while you're here at the show. Right. It also allows you another really quick follow-up immediately with them, and you can really massage towards whatever they might have said to you. And what else do you have? Now, what else do you have generally means that the show you just pitched is not for them. But it means that they really like you, and they liked your pitch. Mm -hmm. so they want to see if you've got something else that might be a better fit for them. So if you've got other ideas, be ready to whip something else out. And can you fly to LA next week? And you might hear that or Toronto, since we're in Canada, your only answer is yes. yes. Yeah, you figure that shit out. <laughs> All right, you're going. Just, I don't care what your kids are doing, you're going. OK, so, but what if the person you're pitching looks like that? That's not good. <laughs> this person's not happy. Something's not happening here. She's confused, thinking about killing you. Yes, perhaps, maybe, if you pitched like him. <laughs> um, so, and you, and, it, and you know, be sensitive too. I know you guys are going to be nervous and you want to get your pitch out, but do feel the room and be sensitive to what that other person is doing. And this is the golden question. What do you think? This is what you ask them. Yeah. If you don't ask this question, your pitch was a waste because you have no clue how to follow up and if they're interested or not. So the biggest thing is make sure that you now listen to what they say. Because they might have great ideas. They might want it. They might be asking certain questions. Answer those questions rather than just saying something that has nothing to do with it. They're paying attention to if you're listening to what they're saying or not. And you know what? Some of the ideas they come up with might help you make it a better show. There's a lot of executives. You know, it There's a lot us. of people joking. A lot, a lot of times about, well, executives are stupid. They don't know what they're doing. You know what? For the most part, we found that they really do know what they're doing, and they come up with some great freaking ideas. Well, like, I was going to say, yeah, it helped know. us on one of our animations. We pitched a show. It wasn't totally developed yet, but that was OK. We were kind of feeling it out. We got great notes and made great changes. Changed the title. One of the executives came up with a title that we thought was better. It's like, yeah, great, done. And you know what that also did? It vested him in the idea. Because mm -hmm. now we're taking his ideas into it. If someone's using part of your idea that you offer to them, don't you feel good about that? You kind of want those executives to feel good about your pitch and what you're bringing to it. OK, and you're going to get this, you know, not for us. Maybe not the hand. Right. Hopefully not, Hopefully the, hand, not the hand, but you could. You hear and, a lot of no's. And here's the thing. Yeah, you're going to hear a lot of no's. And actually, I would prefer hearing a, ve uh, a very direct, clear no then I know, OK, I can, tick, I can tick that network off my list and move on. Kind of like dating. Okay. Ladies, tell us no, <laughs> OK? Because we will keep pestering you if we think there's even the remote possibility that we might get you to go out with us. And it's the same thing for all of us pitching our show. If we think that HBO <laughs> might want our idea, we are going to be like little puppy dogs going, please, please, can you, you know, what's going on? So a no is good. It's not as good as yes, but it's better than not having an answer at all. But you've got to go through a lot of no's before you can find right. that one yes. Right. So 
Let's say you do get a not for us or not at this time, whatever. This is the great next question you can get, you can ask. So what are you looking for? So find out. They'll tell you. Executives love to tell you what's on, the, what kind of, because, um, you know, across schedules, of course, there are shows that are being uh, canceled, ended, whatever, and they've got a spot to fill. So they've got a development slate. So find out where do they have holes. You might just have a show that fits that hole. That happened to, to me when I was doing a pitch to, uh, to Disney a number of years ago. And I was looking at what they had on the air, and we had this one show that I just thought was going to be perfect for them. And when I pitched it, I said, well, it's funny, but, that's, but you know, luckily he said, no, that's, that's not for us. I said, so what are you, are you looking for? He said, well, right now we're really looking for a project with a 13-year-old uh, male lead who becomes a hero in a land and kind of the chosen one. I went, no shit. That was the other show I had. I was, had no intentions of pitching to Disney. I didn't think it would fit for them. I had it with me, though. I pulled that out, and that led to six follow-up meetings with other executives yeah. because that was what they were looking for. Because I asked the question, what are you looking for? Don't leave it something on the table if it might be right for them. Okay, so first rule, first rule of sales, right? If you get a yes, stop pitching, stop selling, and move on to the next phase, which is? Get their contact information. If you don't know how to reach to them, you can't follow up with them. Now, here's the thing. It might seem weird, but a lot of executives are not going to have their business cards. They lost them. It didn't come in their luggage. They ran out of them because so many of you uh, wanted their information. Be prepared to write down their information, okay? And, um, and be prepared. If they don't want to give it to you, bribery with alcohol will work, okay? <laughs> yeah, and also find out how to follow up. Do they want you to call? Would they prefer an email? And then find out when. What's their time frame? Because when executives leave here, they go back. You know, they haven't been in the office, what, five, maybe six days. They are up to here. So they've got to step back into work, answer emails, blah, blah, blah. So find out when they prefer you to follow up. Some will say tomorrow. Others will say two weeks. Yep. So the biggest thing we want to make sure that you guys just have an open door. Even if they say no, if you did a great pitch, that door is open for you to bring back things in the, in the future. How many of you are creative? If I don't see every hand up in here, you're at the wrong place. All right, so you're going to have more ideas. If that door is open, you've got more opportunities to come back. It makes it so much easier to land a pitch meeting if you've done a great one in the first place. And you definitely don't want to be seeing this if you do it all right. And hopefully, you're going to be seeing this. All right? So we're Sell Your TV Concept now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Mark and Jeannie. And of course, thank you to Val and the CMF and Matt and the Banff Center. Uh, we'll be back in about 20 minutes for our next session with the keynote from Minister Jolie. So take some time, have a coffee, take a bathroom break, practice your pitch, and we'll see you back very soon. Thank you. <laughs>